I began to just take, I, I guess I would say extreme ownership and responsibility of the platforms of influence that I had. And when you do those well, yeah. um, and sometimes you're gonna fail, you're gonna learn, but when you try to steward those well, I think God honors you with more platforms of influence to steward. And yeah. so it just started off small, you know, I, yeah. I just kind of understanding that I was a leader. And then I think just looking at what could I do that was in front of me and just trying to do that really well. You don't earn your worth and value. You receive your worth and value every day. Wow. And so the worth and value is already implanted in you. So when I lead, I lead from worth and value. I don't lead to achieve worth and value. That is night and day difference mm -hmm. because I think so many people are hamster wheeling to earn instead of just recognizing and believing in what they already have and who God has already said that they are. So make your escape. Welcome back to another episode of Last in Line Leadership Podcast. And here we are focusing on leadership, but more importantly on faith and serving other people. And you know that we bring this podcast. It, it was born right out of Mark 935 that talks about if you want to be first, you got to be last of all and servant of all. And so that's what we're about, telling stories of people serving people, people coming uh, back from the, the shadows and the depths of adversity, the underdogs, the people that overcome, who press through, who are resilient. We talk about people who serve in the spite of their circumstances and have a heart for other people. So that's where we come from. That's what we're about. And I can't wait to dig in today. Our guest is Benjamin Lundquist. He is the creator and host of Rise and Lead podcast. He's been doing that for six or seven years now. He's been a pastor for 18 years. He's been involved in he's a director of youth ministries for a long time. He um, he does a lot of leadership consulting. He does speaking and training for uh, faith-based organizations, nonprofits, businesses, universities. He's spoken around the world. His podcast is actually listened to in a hundred different countries right now and probably adding to that as we speak. Uh, he, you know, he's run the podcast. He's a husband. He's a father. We're going to talk today about leadership. We're going to talk about courageous leadership, and we're going to talk about leading by example and how hard that could be. And you may not see the fruit immediately from those examples you're setting, but staying in the course is what he's all about, encouraging, inspiring leaders to really rise up and lead, to rise and lead and understand their calling, their potential, and really be able to make a huge impact in this world. So please welcome Benjamin Lundquist to Last in Line Podcast. Hey, now I got a good guest today and I can't wait to welcome him. And here he is, Benjamin Lundquist from Rise and Lee Podcast. Welcome to Last in Line. Hey, John, thanks so much. It's uh, yeah, really an honor to be with you and so glad we worked out uh, the date and time to make this happen and uh, love what you're doing, passion for faith and leadership and excited about our conversation. Yeah, man. And, and hopefully the audience, you know, will show me some grace because we clearly know who's got the better podcast voice today on this recording. So I'm a big fan of ben, Benjamin's. Uh, is it Ben or Benjamin? Is it Which do you prefer? No, either one. Uh, Benjamin probably comes out gotcha. a little bit more, but either one's okay. Gotcha. Okay. Benjamin clearly has the, the voice for podcasting and voiceovers and all kinds of you know, voice stuff. So we, we dig that, but so you're, you know, help us understand a little bit of your journey, who you are. I mean, uh, you know, you've been a pastor for a long time and, and you're in leadership now and you, this is, this is your wheelhouse. So take us through sort of your, I don't know, early adult years, college, and then kind of how you got into this line of work. Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I attended, uh, four different universities kind of in my college time and just, you know, trying to figure out what my, calling and purpose was. And I think like a lot of people put so much pressure into locking on to that perfect career, which just does not exist. And I think mm -hmm. what I wish somebody would have told me early on is that the calling that God has for you, you know, the impact that you're going to make on the world with those unique gifts and abilities, that your career cannot contain your calling, that your career can complement your calling, but it can't contain your calling. And so I think a lot of my college struggling and wrestling 
was just trying to figure out that calling piece by looking to a career. And um, so a lot of, a lot of different changes in there. I swapped majors, I think eight different times uh, in college, which some people say, Hey, that must've been a fun journey. That was a very expensive journey. Yeah. When you think about adding extra years to a, to an undergrad degree, but I finally uh, ended up taking a year off going over and serving as a student missionary on a little Island in the South Pacific and just fell in love with, uh, telling fourth graders about the love of Jesus. And so I think that, that experience for me of just calling a timeout on the college journey, taking a step back, regrouping, resurrendering my life to God, and just focusing on serving the people around me, I think really helped kind of awaken that passion for, you know, investing in what I didn't know what at the time, but really investing in young leaders and investing in emerging leaders with not only, the love of God, the gospel, the hope of Jesus, but also that every young person has so much value and God's got a plan and purpose for their life. And so came back from that experience of taking a year off and uh, ended up uh, going into pastoral ministry and have been doing that in a, in a bunch of different ways for about the last 18 years. And that that's provided me so many opportunities to learn from faith leaders, to learn from community leaders, to learn from business leaders. And I think just over that time, um, kind of understanding, again, the gospel for myself and seeing so many leaders who had the potential to lead well, but they didn't really understand the worth and value that they had. I think I just over time had this growing passion to, you know, one, help people understand how valuable they really are and to help them maximize all the gifts uh, that they have to really create the biggest impact that they can, they can make. So yeah, I, I do a bunch of different things. Um, you know, John, I do a podcast and I really appreciate the podcast that you're doing and that you're growing, but I do a podcast and uh, still am involved in ministry full-time up in Portland, Oregon. And that takes me to, summer camps and speaking opportunities in the States and, and even international. So it's uh, yeah, it's just an honor to serve leaders. Yeah. It's yeah. And that explains why uh, it's challenging to, to pin, to pin you down and track you down. Cause this, this whole summer thing, I mean, you're probably, you've got plates and, you know, spinning and balls in the air and, and you probably don't know whether you're coming or going half the time, which is a good problem to have in the work that you do. Uh, you know, and, and of course, this Rise and Lead pod podcast is where I found you. And, you know, I see your posts, uh, you know, on social media. And I'm I'm just really, you know, enamored by the passion that you have. And, I, and it lines up, like mm. you said, with what we do here. Because Last in Line came to me during the quarantine. And and really, God's showing me the, the verse in Mark 9.35 where he talks about those who want to be first will be last of all and servant of all. Yep. And so I, thought, I started thinking about the servant leadership thing. And, and I know you're right in line with that. But I, I want to ask you kind of a generic question about leadership because sure. you know you've heard the expression if if something means everything then it almost means nothing so i i wonder do you feel like because leadership has been such a buzzword it's been such a movement for a long time and uh, do you feel like it's getting watered down do you feel like the concept of servant leadership has been lost in translation somewhat just in, in corporate America or in general, do you feel like, do you feel like maybe there's a little bit of vanilla flavor to leadership in general? Yeah, I think, I think John, that's a good question. And that there are a lot of buzzwords that, that come and go. I think when you look at leadership, absolutely leadership has, has been a buzzword in, in uh, expanding conversation for the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, even when you think about, um, you know, leadership speakers, authors, and influencers like John Maxwell, mm -hmm. you know, who were kind of kind of opening up the conversation 20 or even 30 years ago about leadership. So I think there is a buzzword around that, but the reality is leadership is in the fabric of every single thing we do. So whether or not it's a buzzword, it's the foundation uh, and woven into everything. It's woven into marriage. It's woven into parenthood. It's mm -hmm. woven into careers. It's woven into you know, whether or not we want to make an impact coaching sports teams or investing in the community. So I feel like even though social media has, has amplified the buzzword of leadership, I think leadership is here to stay because leadership is life. 
And if you want to, you know, see the fruits come out of those areas of your life that matter most, you got to take leadership seriously. And you've got to take leadership seriously in the way you lead yourself, in the way you lead your, your marriage, um, husband and wife, the way you lead your kids and your family, and even what you do in your career. So I think to answer your question, I think it is, I think there always are going to be buzzwords that come and go. I think leadership is so deeply woven into the fabric of life that I think it's here to stay 100%, whether or not the buzzwords fluctuate up and down. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I know that 2,000 years ago, I mean, obviously Jesus was the ultimate servant leader. So that's another reason why it's got staying power, this concept of leadership. And I always argue that we all have the capability. We all have the wiring. For leadership, because you hear people, I'm not a leader. You know, I'm I'm just gonna I'm a good worker. I'll just do what you tell me, and I, but I'm just not a leader. And I say everybody has that in them. Everybody's capable of leading. Mm -hmm. And I will also say, as a caveat to that, like you're leading whether you think you are or not. And it yeah. could be just your apathy in general could be a a statement of leadership in a negative way. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think I think you're right on, and it, it goes back to how do you define what leadership is? And I think for so many people, even me growing up as a kid, you know, I defined leadership as a position and a title. And I, I think for years, I never saw myself as a leader uh, because I didn't have a title and I didn't have a position that I felt like was significant. Yeah. But when you think about leadership and you define it not as titles and positions, but as uh, John Maxwell does, which I think is one of the best working definitions of leadership, that simply leadership is influence. It's not yeah. about titles and positions, but titles and po positions give focus and responsibility to influence. But at the end of the day, every person is a leader because every person has influence, even all the way down to the 12 year old kid on his or her sports team or the kid on yeah. the playground who is influencing other kids, that is leadership. Now, I mean, John, yeah. when you go a little deeper, that does not mean by any, by any means uh, or stretch of the imagination that every person is a great leader. That's a whole different conversation, Correct. but I do think Correct. you're right. I think everybody, John, like you said, has leadership um, inside of them waiting to be awakened and everybody has been given a different amount of influence where their life yeah. directly shapes and shifts the life of somebody else. And that's leadership. Yep. Yeah. And I've heard uh, somebody say I had a guest on and he's actually our youth pastor here at the church uh, that we serve in. And he he's, he's got a master's degree and he said that, you know, there's positional and then there's relational mm -hmm. leadership. And so positional is kind of to your point of saying, you know, you didn't have that title, so you didn't feel like you could step into that role. But, talk, you know, I guess just knowing what you know of about five seconds of me saying that, uh, what do you say about maybe relational leadership versus positional leadership? I mean, you had to evolve into understanding your calling as a leader. Like you may not have had a title, but you still realized you had it and were good, you know, were decent at it and wanted to, to utilize it. So I'm curious what you did with those feelings once you decided, okay, I don't really need the title because I'm relational and I feel like I have influence so I can still lead. What, what do you say to that? Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, for me, it, it was, uh, you know, I can go all the way back to actually when I worked at a summer camp, this was out in Georgia and uh, I'm not sure John, where are you based out of? I'm in Houston area, North suburb. Yeah. Okay. So it was out in, in Georgia and I remember, you know, getting a, a, an acceptance letter to work at a Christian summer camp in Georgia, and I had never worked at a camp before, and I applied to be a boat driver. Long story short, the, uh, the prep week of summer camp, the director came over, and he, after we had done a bunch of training during that week, he handed me the keys to a $100,000 wakeboarding boat as a college student. And, and it was in that moment that I think I really began to see that he may be a director. I may not have as much experience, but I am a leader in the same way that he is a leader because I'm now going to care for the lives of 10 kids 
out on a lake, you know, giving them that safety and that great experience. And so I think for me, you know, kind of, I had always had leadership opportunities, but I just hadn't seen them as leadership because I didn't see myself as a leader. And so I think for me, that little pivot was like being able to look, look at my life and say, Benjamin, you are a leader because you do have influence relationally and God has given you uh, platforms to steward. And so I think for me, I began to just take, I, I guess I would say extreme ownership and responsibility of the platforms of influence that I had. And when you do those well, yeah. um, and sometimes you're going to fail, you're going to learn, but when you try to steward those well, I think God honors you with more platforms of influence to steward. And yeah. so it just started off small, you know, I, yeah. I just kind of understanding that I was a leader. And then I think just looking at what could I do that was in front of me and just trying to do that really well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you said something's important because I think people uh, maybe gloss over these moments, but someone saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And the guy handing you those keys may have thrust you into believing something about yourself that you might not have ordinarily believed in that moment. You might have been overwhelmed, but this guy saying, hey, I trust you. Like, I think that's a big, um, maybe a focal point of the conversation too, is what others see in you could almost springboard you into that acceptance of the concept that I can lead, you know, and I don't have to have a title because somebody sees something in me. I didn't know it. And I just had a guest on the other day that said, yeah, somebody came to me and like presented me with this. Hey, these guys follow you. You're this leader of this group. You didn't even know it, but I see something in you, you know, one of those things. And now all of a sudden, they take it and run with it. Do you have any times in your life where besides, obviously you mentioned that, but like, tell me, I guess, flip the script and you ministering to these young people. Have you seen that be kind of a, a pivotal point in their journey when you kind of, I don't know, nudge them into that calling and, and encourage them to be what, what you see in them? Yeah, a hundred percent, John. I, I think there's, it's pretty safe to say that nobody on, on a human level, nobody is self-made. Everybody yeah. is others made because we're here because, because somebody invested in us. There are those rare individuals who may have had nobody investing yeah. in them, but I would even push back to say, you probably read a book from somebody. You yeah. probably had a conversation with somebody. You probably listened to a podcast. So we are uh, so many times we are where we're at today because somebody saw something in us a hundred percent. Yeah. And they open up a door of opportunity and we could talk about it later, but I think even looking at the way that Jesus empowered people mm. following like the strategy he used in the great commission is all about that. It's all about somebody seeing potential in other people and creating opportunity, giving them clarity of mission, extending real authority, stepping back and letting people know, hey, I'm not going to hold your hand and micromanage you. I am going to be, be with you always, but I'm giving you the authority to lead. And so I think people have done that throughout my entire life. And I try to do the same. One one cool story, I was um, in a Safeway, and I don't know, like a grocery store. Now yeah. I was in an aisle, you know, going down a, grabbing a box of pancake mix or something. And I uh, almost ran into a lady literally. And I said, Oh, I apologized. And she spun around and we knew each other because I had worked with her daughter who was a college student at a local summer camp. Yeah. And she said there in the pancake aisle at Safeway, the grocery store, she said, something you said changed the life of my daughter last summer. That doesn't happen all the time, but when somebody prefaces, a statement with that setup, like I really wanted to hear what she was going to say. And she said, um, you are the first person to call my daughter a leader. And she never saw herself in that way before. And she said, literally, this is just a mom kind of pouring out her heart in the pancake aisle of Safeway. She <laughs> said, you, you or those words changed the life of my daughter because she had never seen herself that way before. Oh, Went back to her university campus. She ended up launching like a whole series of small groups. She started empowering young ladies in her dormitory. So I think you're exactly right, John. We are here because somebody or God invested in us in a particular way that opened a door that 
that let us believe the potential that we may not have seen you know, within ourselves. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head too, because you, you had me thinking, now you've got me, my, the wheels turning about discipleship. And like you said, Jesus, really that the model of discipleship and, and even out of, <clears throat> what is it? Second Timothy 2, 2, I believe is, you know, teach, you know, take what you've learned from me, teach it to faithful men so that they can teach others also. Yep. And it's sort of a downstream, like discipleship, benefit, training, coaching, but uh, you know, it's funny because you, you're telling me, you know, talking about Jesus and all the examples of him empowering other people. And, you know, in, in a way, he kind of handed Peter the keys to that boat you were talking about when he, you know, hey, you're going to build the church. And Peter's like, what? Like, are you kidding me? You know, so I think even back then, people really needed somebody to see and and kind of nudge them in that direction of leadership because you may not always go there on your own. And, and I like that you kind of pulled a quote out of Jocko's extreme ownership. I like that, yep. you know, and uh, so, so kind of transitioning a little bit um, we talk about, cause you, you know, leading by example is a big thing. And, and obviously in order to pass the mantle to somebody of leadership, you sort of need to be decent at it yourself, right? You need to exhibit the qualities that you're giving them the keys to, to exhibit themselves. And so when we talk about a leading by example, let's just say I have a struggle and maybe you can help walk me through this, but I have four children, you know, and my oldest is 23. My youngest is 14 and I've got a couple in between and we've done the whole competitive baseball thing. I've coached, we've traveled. Um, it's just a big thing. And, you know, sports is a big deal. Well, leading by example, I, I feel like I got them involved in weight training early. Okay. And, but then it kind of fizzled. Like after you're done mm. in competitive sport, you know, you don't always keep those same disciplines because you really don't have that kind of trophy to chase. It, it gets discouraging as a parent. So talk to maybe a dad right now that maybe yep. they're sowing those seeds and they're leading by example, but they don't see those kids following. They're, they're children following yet, I'll say. Yeah, it's a big word. So it's a seed time and harvest concept. But talk about us through that waiting period. Talk us through that as, as dads who are doing the right thing, where heads are down, you know, we're grinding, doing things. But then we kind of like our kids aren't kind of following suit like we think. Talk about that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, you know, I'm, I'm a super passionate as as everybody is, you know, dad, you know, and, and I think a lot about those questions, John, of setting examples, uh, setting my kids up for success. You know, a lot of those questions that, that come in that uh, vein of fatherhood, you know, I think back, I'll tell you a story, but I think, I think to answer your question, you know, when you have the gift of having your kid for 18 years and you may, you may in this day and age, your kid may live with you till they're 35. Who knows, who knows how that's going to play out, <laughs> but you, but let's just say you have your kid for, for, for 18 years. I think what you're doing in those 18 years is you are laying a foundation and you are tilling the soil. So growth can happen um, in the lives of your kids, hopefully long-term. And I think with that, We've got to just understand and understand that the um, investment that we're making, that it's going to uh, pay out with dividends and fruit at different times and different yeah. seasons. And yeah. that really is up to God, you know, yeah. when that happens. So I think for me, when it comes to, you know, my kids are athletic, they play all the sports as well. I think what I try to do is I want to set the example of like their dad is leading himself extremely well. Their dad, uh, my kid's dad, is um, honoring the worth and value that God has put in him. So I think for me, the greatest example that I can give my kids is to lead myself well, mm -hmm. knowing that when they see that, whether or not they're into it one week or they're out doing something else a different week. And that's just kind of how kids are like kids yeah. are all over the place. We forget, but I think what we forget, we that, do, right. <laughs> you know, and sometimes they're hyper-focused and you think to yourself, oh, they're going to be into this sport for the next five years. And like a year later, they drop it and they sure. join the cross or something else. So I think, you know, just remembering like the greatest example is in how we lead ourselves. And I, I heard somebody say, and John, this was so potent for me. Mm. I heard somebody say the, the greatest way that you can love your kids is in the way you love your wife. Yes. And, and it was the idea of your kids are always watching yeah. and you can't base, you can't base the fruits of their life 
on what is happening in the moment because you're investing micro investments for 18 years. So what can you do? You can lead yourself extremely well and you can try to try the best you can to love your, your wife or your husband, you know, depending on uh, what makes sense in your context, the best that you can and your kids are watching everything. And they're every time you do that, I think you're laying the soil and you're, you're laying a foundation, you know, for them. So give yourself grace when they're not into what you think they should be into. Sure. But at the end of the day, you have to lead yourself well, because yeah. otherwise you have no energy for what matters most. Yeah. And so I think you can't, you can't base self-leadership on whether or not your kids are into whatever you're doing. You've got to be into leading yourself well, because yep. leading yourself well matters. So you can be an engaged husband yeah. um, and you can be a great father for your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And, and you, you know, you took a page right off my notes here. Cause I said, I have literally written down here, doesn't always yield immediate fruit. And you said yep. pretty much those exact words. And, and I, I, that's what I think can, can, I, I don't speak for everybody, but I'm assuming there's some folks out there in the camp that is, man, I'm a dad leading well, you know, people aren't necessarily following yet. Well, they're teenagers. I mean, remember when we were teenagers, but, but, you know, so does that knock them off course? And I think sometimes if a dad's doing it for the wrong reasons, to your point, like we got to be doing it because that's what we're supposed to do. Not because yeah. I'm leading as a dad because my kids, I want them to follow. And if they don't, then I'm just going to go over here and eat Cheetos and play, you know, Call of Duty for 12 hours, you know, whatever. And so there are guys out there, I think, that are being swayed a little bit in their disciplines by who's responding right to their leadership. But you're saying, yep. and I agree because I keep doing it. I keep my head down. It's a, it's a war of attrition, right? It's a, it is yeah. a long game. And so again, we benefit because we can be who we need to be by staying in shape, right? By feeding our minds with the word and, and equipping ourselves, putting on the armor every day and loving our wives. I'm glad you said that, man, because I didn't plan on this going down a parenting or marriage trail, but yep. leadership is leadership and what more important, what leadership's more important than in the home. So I'm glad you brought that up, man. Um, and for, I should just say, I also, yeah, yeah. I just for just to say one more comment on that. And I think for dads who are just cranking out the discipline, yeah, I mean, as far as their personal discipline, your, your habits, I think just another word to remember is, you're not a robot. Like yeah. you're meant to be emotionally available yeah. and in tune with your kids, like lay on your, lay on the bed with your kid at night yeah. and debrief the day. You know, I think kids are not looking for a dad who's always right. They're looking for a dad who's real yeah. and a dad who is trying to lead himself well. And when, you know, he goes through struggles, talk about that with your kids. You know, I, I heard somebody say, I, I was hanging out doing a podcast with some, researchers from a group uh, called the Fuller Youth Institute out in California. This was earlier this week, and they did a bunch of research on like high school students and anxiety, mental health, depression. And one piece of advice or comment that a researcher shared on this podcast as we were dialoguing, and he said this, he said, you got to take the pressure off of your kids to be everything and everything to everyone. You want your kids to help uh, you want you to help your kids, uh, you know, achieve their potential and all that kind of stuff. But he said, take the pressure off. And instead of just pressuring your kids, tell your kids a lot more real stories of how you struggled in your life and kept moving forward. Of course. All the times I had eight degrees in college, the times that I bombed that public sermon, you know, the times that small group didn't go well, that time I didn't get that job. But I think just leading yourself well with the balance of you got to be a dad who's real yeah. and, and is painting a real picture of the ups and downs. God be with you, you know, through your life because your kids are going to remember that. Yeah, I'm glad. you. Yeah, because I mean, I, I get convicted a little bit. I think my wife thinks I'm a little too transparent because I have a I have a definite before and after Jesus life. And so yep. my before Jesus, you know, isn't so pretty. And I, I try to be a little bit transparent and obviously sensitive to the age group and those kinds of things. But I let them know, look, I, I'm way different. You know, God came in and just, you know, the the redemptive factor of the grace of God, like, 
changed everything. And you guys yeah. wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't even be here probably if that hadn't happened. So it's, uh, it's definite. I love that you said real because man, they don't want to, they don't want to see like, we want to be the hero of course to, to our children, but it, it doesn't feel to them relatable if everything we do looks perfect and shiny and buttoned up and we buffer them from every mistake we've ever made. Right. That doesn't, I don't think that helps them for real life. And and I think there's a, there's a great book called the coddling of the American mind and uh, it talks about parenting the next generation and says, don't, don't prepare the road for your children, prepare your children for the road. And mm. so it's, it's, I love that quote. And uh, Hey, before we get back to the episode, I want to thank our sponsors and encourage you to go to their website, look at their purpose, look at their mission, look at their gear. Um, we've got some really good partners and supporters here. I want to list off uh, in no order of importance, but they're all equally valuable to us and we appreciate them. I want to start with Armored Co- Coffee um, and Armored Nation. Randy LaVere uh, makes great product, bringing gospel and uh, to the to the to the marketplace and uh we've got do work that matters they've got some great gear great logo uh cowboy revolution their apparel line is fantastic go check them out we've got lead like lions um with kevin fulton just a great mission just serving people serving the kingdom and representing uh their faith in a big way and then last but not least we've got gridiron coffee and brad lord and uh, Brad's got this uh, coffee company that has really taken off and, and really represents uh, solid character, morals, values. Um, he's a great guy, and he's doing great things to give back to the community and young people, uh, young athletes in the community. So go check out his coffee. Go check out all of their websites, all of their gear. Hey, and don't forget to enter the discount code when you go to get some of their gear. Uh, last in line should get you 20% off. So don't forget to plug that in. Don't forget to leave them a review uh, and and thank them for supporting last in line and creating great products. Now back to the show. But no, so your podcast, man, I want to talk a little bit about that because for those people that aren't are listening to this that don't follow your podcast, they will after this because man, the the energy that you have, and the heart comes through the microphone. And, and so mm-hmm. it, it it's very powerful how you, because everything you say, it feels like you're, you're living it, like you're right in the middle of it and you're not just saying it because it sounds good. Um, so it, it's in, in your, po- your mission for the podcast, I'm going to read it, says it's designed to equip and motivate listeners to live their greatest life with maximum impact. What does that look mm-hmm. like to you? What is living this greatest life with maximum impact in your, in your world, what's that look like? Yeah. You know, I, I think for me, it, it goes back to, you know, living your greatest life is recognizing over your lifetime, because I think it takes a lifetime to unpack, but it's recognizing over your lifetime, the incredible and limitless worth and value that every person has. And as you understand over your lifetime, the incredible worth and value that God has given you. And I, this, this is just such a passion of mine, John, that mm-hmm. you don't earn your worth and value. You receive your worth and value every day. Wow. And so the worth and value is already implanted in you. So when I lead, I lead from worth and value. I don't lead to achieve worth and value. That is night and day difference mm-hmm. because I think so many people are hamster wheeling to earn instead of just recognizing and believing in what they already have and who God has already said that they are. So, you know, for me, greatest life of maximum impact, it's again, over that lifetime, understanding, believing, and living from that incredible worth and value that that you have. And then recognizing like, what gifts do I have in front of me and what opportunities do I have to bless my marriage and my family and the community whether that's local, whether that's global. And so I think for me, it's a real, you know, kind of a challenge for listeners to say, like, we only get one shot at this life. You don't get a redo. You know, you have an eternal life. We're blessed by that gift, but you only get one shot. So what are you going to do with your one shot? And, you know, believe in who you are, believe in who you are and that worth and value operate from that place. 
and then start really taking ownership of those opportunities and, and those gifts. And so a lot of the content that I share is, you know, what I feel is going to be a high value to help people discover their gifts and abilities to expand their impact quicker and yeah. more efficiently than they would if they were just trying to struggle and figure that thing out yeah. on their own. Yeah. Yeah. And I get that it comes across and, and uh, you know, I want to, I wonder too, you know, the person listening because uh, mental health is a, a, a hot button today, yep. you know, these days and especially over the last couple of years and, and depression and insecurity and these fears and doubts and, you know, talk to the guys now, you know, cause most of these believers listening to this Christian men primarily, so talk to them. How did you get there? How do they get there to just, uh, aside from reading it on a page in the Bible where God says you're more than a conqueror, you know, God says you're a mighty man of valor, you know, these things. And how did you get there to just really understand that that was part of your DNA, my worth and value? That's where I'm going to lead from. I'm not going to lead to earn that. So guys yeah. right now are so stuck in this dichotomy of trying to learn it right? And lead from or yep. earn it and lead from it, but they can't get here if they don't get here. So you're saying it's already innate that worth and value should be where you lead from. Talk to guys who have a problem with that. Yeah. You know, I, I'd say, um, you know, one case study or, you know, biblical story that I think for me has been um, just such a foundational piece. And especially I think men can relate to this. If you just go and look at the the story of Jesus talking about the prodigal son, mm. and then I'll just kind of build from there, you know, but it, and I would say the, um, the majority of people probably, John, know the gist of that story. you got a really wealthy family. The youngest son says, Hey, I'm going to go out and pave my own path. I'm going to live my own life, takes his inheritance, goes out, squanders it, lives this life out in the world. Famine hits. And when famine hits, you know, you've got this tragedy. And I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting observation that when tragedy hits our life, you're going to know where your foundation is. And you're yeah. going to know what your life is really anchored to. Not when life is, not, not when you're hitting home runs, yeah. but when you're striking out at the plate every single time. So in this, you know, narrative that Jesus shares, famine hits, the uh, youngest son, you know, finds himself with this pig pen of life because he can't get a job doing anything else. And he has this epiphany as he's feeding pigs. So think about the fact that John, he had gone from wealth, um, security, safety. He had gone from that experience to now barely surviving in the pig pit, pig pen of life. And in this moment, he does something that I think so many men do. He immediately began to devalue himself because of his circumstances instead of remembering the value that had always been in him. Here's what happened. He said, uh, as he's having this self-reflective conversation, he says, I am no longer, think about this. I am no longer worthy to be a son. So I am going to return home as a servant. The words that we as men speak over our own life matter. And what was spoken in that story in the pig pen of life, that was just a blatant lie. That wasn't true. But the circumstances of life had caused that youngest son to see his value connected to his circumstances instead of the, the value that had been given to him by his father. So he replays yeah. that whole conversation. And you know how the story goes. He goes mm -hmm. home. The father meets him on the road, so symbolic of the father taking the shame upon himself that would have been given the son had the son come to the gate of the home right. as, as kind of the broke son now returning home to seek mercy from the family. So the father goes out and he basically in that moment says in so many words, listen, you have been a son always like there was never a moment in your life when you were not a son, when you were gambling the stuff away, when you were partying, living that life, you were always a son. When you were in the pig pen, you were always a son. When you were devaluing yourself, saying that you were only worth being a servant, you were yeah. always a son. And then in that beautiful moment, you know, the father in that story uh, by Jesus basically reestablishes the identity of the son as as being an heir to the family and being royalty which he yeah. always was he just didn't see himself in right. that way yeah and and so to the guys listening it it your circumstances don't change 
who you are, who God says yep. you are, who he made you to be, who you're called to be. Like you, you it doesn't take that out of you, right? Your heart's yep. still beating and it's still, you know, you still have that, that, etched in it that you know child of god etched in the heart and so you you can do a lot of things to to take you away from the father but he's still always ready to welcome you you know with their open arms and so hopefully that resonates with somebody because i feel like that that's where we get derailed i feel like we yep. we don't see the value in the worth or we're trying to earn it and before we can step into this leadership and and sometimes you know sometimes that's just impossible and sometimes it's unattainable and we hold these expectations that that are unattainable and so yeah i'm i love that story man i i didn't see that coming and I, i'm so glad you did that cuz that that's a perfect illustration um i and i listened to, yeah yeah go go i'm just going to yeah. say and to, and to get real practical because i think at the end of the day inspiration without strategy falls short. Like you got to give people something to do, you know? And so I I try to do that on the podcast, but I think for any, any guys who are thinking, yeah, great thought, but how do I actually live? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. You know, if you choose to believe the worth and value, John, that you have, like you are choosing to believe that God considers you royalty, that royalty flows through your veins. You are choosing to believe that. Then how do you live that out? You know, I think for me, I always go back to these four steps, call it a strategy, and they're, they're real simple. But the first thing is um, you have to speak words about yourself that are in harmony with what God has said about you. Yeah. And if you're a man of faith, I'm just going to tell, tell you like I see it as it is. If you're saying things about yourself that are not in harmony with what God has said about you, that's a lie. And you're never going to achieve your purpose and your calling if you you are speaking lies over your own life. And so we all do that at times. But I think the point is you've got to catch it and you've got to be able to say, I may be thinking that, but that's not true. God hasn't said said that about me. He hasn't said that my past defines me. He's never said that I can't have a great future because I had a complicated past. I don't know your story, John, but I would guarantee there's some complexity in your past. Oh yeah. You were kind of alluding to. So I think, you know, number one, men, you got to speak truth over your own life. Like you have to do that and you got to steward your words. You know, your words are not just a, a vomit of, of, you know, poorly chosen statements about you. Like you got to be really specific with what you say about yourself. Second thing is that I would recommend is write a declaration statement about your life. Every Mm -hmm. morning, write it in your own handwriting Uh, research backs up that if you just write a vision down, it ups the chance of that coming to fruition by 50% just by writing it down in your own handwriting. So write it down. My declaration statement, John, may be something when I do that in the morning, it may look like this. You know, Benjamin is a son of God always. He is completely accepted. He is uh, totally forgiven. He is uh, extremely valuable and he is eternally loved. He will live this day with intention towards greatness, whatever it is. Yeah. Let me add a caveat to that too for the listeners. This isn't something that Benjamin just made up and decided he was going to flip a coin and see if it worked. This, that's a biblical concept. Like Habakkuk 2.2 says, have a vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. And that's right in line with what you're talking about. So I want the listeners to understand that's right out of the Bible, people. So, yeah, go ahead. What's number yeah, three? Absolutely. Um, yeah, just, you know, you may you may think to yourself, oh, like, will that really make a difference? Give yourself 30 days, like do it every morning for 30 days. Your mind mindset will shift. Do all the research you want about neuroplasticity. The beautiful yeah. thing is nobody's mind is set in stone. Yeah. It can shift and it can change. Yeah. So I think write that statement. Third thing would be that I would recommend is you have to surround yourself with people who affirm what God has said about you. So your inner circle of friends, of mentors, of advisors, they need to see the worth and value that God has put in you. And I'll just, I'll just speak it the way I see it. If you've got an inner circle, who's not affirming what God has said about you, they shouldn't be in your inner circle. I'm just going to say it like that. They shouldn't be there. And I, and, and you really want people 
who you are giving permission to say, when I am being stupid, call me out for doing something stupid. If you hear me share a tone when speaking with my wife that is not honoring to her, call me out on that. If you see me being impatient with my kids, say something like iron sharpens iron. We want to become better. So you got to surround yourself with the right people. And last thing I would share very simply is um, you have to speak life and truth into other people. So it's not just about like, take, 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 build your life up. Your life is being built up with purpose and attention so you can impact the life of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So look for opportunities. And I, I love, John, that you coach athletic teams, all the access you have to kids and parents, you know, look for opportunities to affirm the worth and value in anybody within your circle of influence and even go as so far. And it depends on the relational connection you have with somebody, but even go to the extent of, if you hear somebody speaking a lie over their own life, if you have the relational capital, take an opportunity to say, I just got to stop you right there. I hear what you're saying, but that's not what God said about you. Yeah. That's not what God thinks about you. I see what God sees in you. And I want to remind you, your potential is limitless. You know, your current situation is not your final destination. Yeah. That you got all the potential in the world. And so I think for yeah. me, that's kind of where that foundation, I just always go back to that place. And and you know, I got so I got horrible days and I got bad days. And we we have had, you know, in the last four months, John, probably the hardest four months that my family has ever had. You know, my I got a sister dealing with cancer, uh, my youngest nephew almost died on my birthday by a car accident that took, that happened um, about four hours South. One of our best friends in the world, um, his son who called me uncle took his life, committed suicide about four months ago. So we've been, we've had a really challenging last couple months and every day, this is just me pulling back the veil. I go back to, this is what God says about me. This is who I am. I am royalty. I am always part of God's family. I am always a son. And I am going to choose to operate from that reality, even if I don't feel like it. And the majority of time, I may not feel like it, but I'm going to claim it as truth, whether I feel like it or not. Man, a lot of power there. A lot of that, you know, just the story of your last couple months. And I, I can feel some of that. You know, I've had a similar mother-in-law passed away. And like I told you today, you know, today we had to put our dog down. And uh, I will say, as it relates to leadership, which is our theme is people are going to watch what we do in those moments. And I, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, and, and Esther was created for a time such as this, you know? And so I feel like as leaders, we're created for a time when the fire is at its hottest point. Mm. And, and when that stuff around us is erupting or imploding, we rise and kind of as the tip of the spear, right? We get in the face of that storm. And uh, I heard you talk about uh, the buffalo and the cow. And I have a friend who, whose podcast is built around that exact concept. Mm-hmm. In fact, I sent him your podcast on that oh, you well. did about the buffalo. Yep. Um, but no, I so leaders, guys that are listening right now, we have an opportunity to really drive and set the tone in our families and in our sphere when adversity hits us like that. We have an opportunity to let our feelings dictate and emotions dictate and really fly off and just kind of derail, or we can rise up and lead the way we're supposed to. And they, they all watch that and they've been watching me because I've had opportunities Mm -hmm. to really kind of lose my temper in situations with other people. And man, I've just tried to stay, stay, keep my head down and, and keep the main thing, the main thing. But, um, Man, that's a great. I love those four points. Uh, I wanted to talk before I let you go because I know we're, you know you're probably up against it um, on your schedule, but but that same podcast I think that we were just talking to I was just alluding yep. to with the with the buffalo. You, it was you, you talked about five practices for becoming a courageous leader, and and I I love that episode, man. Um, and I I really it all of these points were just resonate clicking, and, and so maybe we can hit those from a 20,000 foot view without getting real granular for the sake of time. But there's a couple in here. I'll just list them. You said practice vulnerability, yep. set big goals, reward failure, 
make decisions and empower other leaders. So we've kind of covered the empower other leaders. I want to hit on maybe two that are, that stood out to me, the vulnerability piece. Nobody likes that word. Yep. Nobody likes that word, but I kind of do. Um, I kind of like the vulnerability piece because it, it couples and parlays nicely with humility sometimes. Yep. And I'm all about gratitude and humility as being kind of the anchors. So talk about vulnerability, man, and, and why people have a problem with that. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, vulnerability is a buzzword too. And I think, you know, there, there's just a lot, there's a lot of definitions I think that are out there of vulnerability, you know, and whether it's, you know, calling people to emotionally vomit on social media, yeah. you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I think when I look at vulnerability, you know, I think vulnerability is recognizing that there is strength in acknowledging your weaknesses and acknowledging yeah. the areas that are not perfect and the areas that you need to grow and develop in. And so, you know, Brene Brown, uh, who is a, a shame researcher, and I, I think all her stuff, I think, is, fan, is pretty much fantastic. But Brene Brown says that vulnerability is the, is the antidote for shame. You know, that when we, we look at a, our past and we think, you know, I'm, I'm going to de- keep devaluing myself because my past is so complicated and, yeah. and I did all these things or I you know, had, had these promiscuous relationships, whatever it may be. I think that's where vulnerability says from a faith standpoint says, hang on, you can be vulnerable and you can open up about the complexities of your life, your struggles and what you're going through. You can do that with the confidence that opening up does not determine the worth and value that you have, that you are becoming vulnerable because you are already worthy and valuable by God. And that makes Mm -hmm. a big difference because then, you know, John, if you're sitting around a, you know, in a small group or you're going to dinner, you're doing a man camp out, whatever it is with uh, going to a lake trip and you got a bunch of mentors around you, you know, that if you open up about a struggle, you know, it's going to be good for you in the right setting. But if you open up, you know, that that group does not determine your worth and value in any way they can affect firm, but they don't determine it. And so you, you can choose to be vulnerable, which is part of your healing and growth process from the worth and value that you already have. Mm -hmm. And so I think it it is so courageous to do that. And really that hard work of being vulnerable is what helps us as men work through the junk of our past and turn our past into our purpose or our pain Mm -hmm. into our purpose. So I think vulnerability, it is that hard work of forgiveness that says, I want to come to a place where I can talk about this. Why? Because my pain can be turned into a purpose that can help somebody else out. And, And I can use what I've been through to help other people rise up higher. And so absolutely, if you want to be courageous, believe in your worth and value, and then find the right place. And I think that's key. It's not everywhere. It's not, you know, (laughs) you throwing out your laundry on, on Instagram, but find the right place where you can be vulnerable and say with the right group, this is who I am. This is what I I'm struggling with. I had a young man who called me uncle for 21 years that we just lost to suicide. This is where I'm at. I'm having one of the hardest four month, four month periods of my life. And I just want to lay it out there, you know, yeah. and somehow God's going to meet me in this space. Yeah. So yeah, I think vulnerability is a huge step yeah. of courage. And I'll just say to any, any man out there, most people are not going to do it because they're scared of it and sure. they're just, they're just not going to do it. But I will tell you this, If you'll do that, that is the hard work and it's hard, but it is the hard work that will help uncover the purpose that God has for you. Yeah. And I think so much of our purpose and calling, and I wish we had time to unpack some, some stuff I've been reading in, in, uh, Nehemiah that have been Mm -hmm. game changers, Mm -hmm. but I think so much, so much, so much of our life, what breaks our heart the most is what God is calling us into to create the greatest change. So you have to sit often in the heartbreak of, and the pain and out of that commitment to the hard work, God will raise up an incredible purpose for your life. 
out of that pain, but you're going to have to be vulnerable sure. and vulnerability. It means you got to be courageous, but when you know who you are and know whose you are, I think you have a lot more courage to do that. Yeah. And, and that vulnerability element makes room for this posture that we decrease so that he can increase. And so yep. when we, when we can decrease in that way of being vulnerable, it magnifies the work that he's done in our life. Like yep. I, I would argue that shame is the antithesis to this redemptive nature of Christ yep. that we all stand on. So uh, let's use it. Like let's not use the shame, but let's use some of those hardships and some of that failure. Uh, and which is going to great segue into our, our last point here, but uh, let's use some of that to like magnify the work that he's done. Like look at me now yep. type thing. And, and so that gives hope for people. And, and yeah, you're right in the middle of this, uh, I don't even know if it's a valley, what it is, but emotionally you guys are almost what it feels like in crisis, but, 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 you know, to get vulnerable as a family and to just not suppress these emotions and feelings, but let's use them kind of as catalysts, yep. right. To lean in, lean into what God has for us, lean into how he pulls us out of stuff. Um, so that does segue into the failure component, man. I, I love that you added reward failure. So yep. man, I'm going to let you, I'm going to tee that up and let you just, take a big old hack at it. Um, and then we'll close up shop, but man, how did you come up with reward failure out of five ways of becoming a courageous leader? Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, again, when you know who you are, you know, that failure does not define you. So you can't be afraid to really put yourselves out there, um, and try some things that you have never tried before. And I, I, you know, because I know this is a faith audience, you know, I wouldn't say this on every podcast, but I think there are people who don't have a growing faith because they're not doing anything in their life that requires faith. They've got uh, everything yeah. under control. Like yeah. there's nothing, there's no unknown in their life at all. And they're wondering like, man, my relationship with God is stagnant. I'm not growing. Well, my question would be, what are you doing in your life that requires faith? Where do you have to step out and, and, and um, depend on God beyond what you already got in the bag. And so I think rewarding failure is really about looking for those opportunities to do what you have never done before, knowing that you're not going to be defined by whether it's a success or it doesn't go as planned. Now hear me on this. You're going to prep. Well, you're yeah. like, you're not, you're not going to set yourself up for an epic failure. Yeah. If it does happen, happen, you're going to learn from that. But I think just reward that in your life, you know, and, and think about, you know, becoming a courageous leader is not, is being, not being afraid to step out in the unknown. And that's biblical. Like every leader of faith in scripture was constantly stepping into the unknown all the time. That's, that's what it was. It was one assignment or purpose after another, that was a moment of God. We never been here. We've never done this. I've never done this. Read it's Joshua you, one. Yeah. yeah read Joshua it's one. hundred <laughs> percent. It's right. you or fail failure. And so whether you're, you know, looking at the, the, those pillars of faith in scripture, yeah. but that was the life. It was always stretching and growing and depending on God. And I think in those moments of failure, just recognizing that, uh, you know, our, our failures or our past, that it's not a life sentence, it's a life lesson. Yeah. And so the biggest loss of failure is not learning and maximizing the learning opportunities of the failure. What happened? Why did it go like that? Where was my mindset when that happened? How, what, what was the recovery like? Did I miss the, the boat on the prep? What was going on? But I think really looking at, you know, how can I learn from what happened and every failure doesn't have to be a massive failure. We can have micro failures too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll give a case study. You know, if I go coach a kid's, um, you know, baseball team, lacrosse team, and it just ends up being a bad night for whatever reason, that may be a failure of leadership in that mm -hmm. night. Yeah. And I've got to sit back and say, what was going on? Well, I didn't get my mindset on God earlier in the day. And I let the stresses of my job overtake me. And I, I brought those stresses and that yeah. anxiety onto the field with these kids. And I laid that on top of them, even though that wasn't had nothing to do with them, you know? And so I think just there's learn from the micro failures. It doesn't have to be an epic, massive failure, 
but I think you got those moments where it could have gone better. And if it yeah. could have gone better, learn from that opportunity and just be a leader who is committed to always learning. And that, that's one thing that I've, I try to practice um, is just being a leader who always learns. And I think if a leader stops learning, he or she will stop leading effectively. Like you always have to be looking to learn. And in those micro or macro moments of failure, you have some of the greatest learning opportunities of your life right in front of you. So ask the tough questions. What happened here? Why did it happen? What should have happened in this moment? And how am I going to get there next time so I can be better when I have this chance and opportunity again? Yeah. Uh, of course, man. And and we don't, we kind of miss the forest for the trees sometimes and, and fail to see the long, yep. long-term benefit from a short-term mistake or a, a short, you know, a failure that's in the short term could, could necessarily, I mean, if you, if you take it again out of scripture, you know, God works all things together for good for those who love him. So in this moment where I missed it, right. Or I just colossal failed, whatever it is, uh, you know, there's good that can come out. There's always a silver lining to something depending on how we react to it and, and what we did learn. So that's why I think, yeah, of course it's key to, and, and, and I would say even, you know, tangibly and practically writing down things that you learned in that moment or those, those, that season of, Oh man, that was, that was epic failure, you know? Okay. So I did this wrong. Here's what I would do next time. And, and then we don't repeat those things. And so, Man, that's good. It's a good take on that. And and I would I would imagine you've got some areas in your life just like I do where you could probably go into examples of that. Um, but for the sake of time, you know, Benjamin, it's been it's been awesome having you, dude. I, I Thank mean you, man. I consider this a new relationship and maybe we stay in contact. Um where can we get some of your resources? And 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 I think I read that you're an author. Is that right? Like I didn't see where to find your book, but can, do you have a book out, or are you in the process, or what is that? Yeah, so um, you can find me on Instagram is probably the easiest way, and that that's how we connected, John. You can just send yeah. me a, a DM on Instagram, but I'm also on like Twitter and LinkedIn yeah. and and all those those other platforms as well. But Instagram is probably the best. And the podcast, uh, Rise and Lead, you can find that on any, you know, probably like yours, any podcast platform, Spotify, yeah. iTunes, Google Play, uh, which is which is really easy. If there's any uh, question you have specifically about, um, you know, content, the way it can serve you, uh, my website is riseandlead.com. So you can check that, that off or check that out as well. And then I've written a number of ministry resources, a lot for churches, for universities. And yeah. if you DM me, I can tell you where to find all those as well. Yeah. There will be a book coming, just kind of wrestling with with the Lord on that one. And uh, yeah. I think I think we're pretty honed in on, on what that's going to be about, but just kind of waiting for the right timing. And you know, you can't you can't do it all, and so you just got to wait for the cards to line up, you know, just right, and for then sure. uh, kind of step into that step into that yeah. space. So, but it, it's an honor, man. I love what you're doing. And you got a great passion and heart, and I can already hear the commitment you have for your family and for what you're doing. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks very much. And he is also for hire on coaching and speaking as well. Yep. So there's a place on his website to reach out and schedule him and and just connect at the very least because this guy's got a lot of gold, a lot of experience, and got a heart for leaders and and calling them into their purpose. So, hey, with that, he's been Benjamin Lundquist. We've been last in line. Be blessed. Be blessed.